Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Elsie Wanjiku. I'm from IntelliCup, joining from Nairobi, Kenya, and welcome to Suncal Global Summit Day 2. Uh, the topic today is transforming food systems and the role of civil society in market and uh, state. So this session is also being streamed on Hova. So welcome all. And I hope uh, you're excited about the session as I am. Uh, I would now like to pass it to the moderator of the day, who is Vara Tijoshi. Uh, please do take it away. Thank you, guys, and welcome all. Thank you, Elsie. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, we will dive right into the theme, which is transforming food systems in India, the role of civil society, market, and state. And we have three stalwarts today representing different sectors. Uh, India, as we all know, accounts for only 2.4% of the world's geographical area. It has 4% of its water resources, and yet it's supporting 17% of the world's population and 15% of its livestock. With 12.5 uh, crore farmer households, of which 85% are small and medium farmers with land holdings less than two hectares, small and marginal farmers. Uh, we just have this as the tip of the challenge where food system in India is concerned. And several studies by uh, different research institutions and global uh, institution uh, players have shown that there is a juxtaposition of contrasts and extremes where food system in India is concerned. And production and productivity is just one challenge. We see that there is a lot of intersectionality in terms of how biophysical, commercial, cultural, demographic, political and socio-economic forces interact in India. It's just mind boggling. And we see a lot of extremes, for example, high performing states, low performing states where agriculture is concerned, changes in consumer demand and food preferences over time, diet transition. We have uh, poverty combined with malnutrition, undernutrition, and also obesity in the same country. We find that there are institutional innovations happening, but they are disparate. Climate change is also uh, posing a fresh challenge to the way food system, food uh, availability is concerned, nutrition availability is concerned. Therefore, there are four key challenges that we have put forth for ourselves to uh, discuss the role of actors around. The first is how to make food systems in India adaptive and resilient. Second is to ensure how to ensure nutritious food for all. The third is how we can ensure that the food system operates within the planetary boundaries, the concern of carrying capacity. And lastly, how to support livelihood and well-being. With, this, with these four challenges in mind, we will today discuss the role of civil society, the private sector and government. And with us, we have three panelists. Uh, whom I'll introduce. First is Mr. Shiva Kumar. He is a member of the Corporate Management Committee of ITC Limited, a multi-business con conglomerate with interests in consumer goods, hotels, agribusiness, paper boards, packaging and information technology. He oversees companies agri and IT businesses as also companies social investments and sustainability initiatives. Mr. Shiva Kumar is well known as the architect of ITC's e -Chopal which is a pioneering farmer empowerment initiative, which has benefited over 4 million small farmers through customized agri extension and market linkage services, while providing a unique source of competitive advantage to ITC's packaged food business. He's, he has come from Institute of Rural Management, the education part, and served, as a, served with a farmer's cooperative for six years before he joined ITC in 1989. So welcome, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Thank you. We have with us Mr. Rajiv Ahal, who works in GIZ India as Director of Natural Resource Management and Agroecology in the Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resource Cluster. There he leads bilateral projects on water security and climate adaptation and global projects on sustainable soil management. He coordinates other projects in agroecology, rural development, social protection, sustainable farming systems, market-led development, artificial intelligence, value chain development and FPOs with various government ministries and state governments. He has graduated in engineering, holds a diploma in gestalt from the International Program for Organizational and Systems Development. He has over 33 years of experience working with international agencies, governments, civil society, and private sector in India, and also in African countries. He loves to write, and he, whenever he can, he has published fiction as well as non-fiction works. So welcome, uh, Mr. Rajiv Ahal. Uh, thank you, thank you. 
and we have uh, Mr. Shalesh Nagar, who has 25 years of experience in the development sector, spanning thematic areas of natural resource conservation and management, climate change, rural livelihoods, local governance, gender, and child rights. He strongly believes that addressing current complex problems, especially in NRM domain, especially agriculture and other ecosystems, requires multi-sectoral and systemic approaches. He, present, he is presently working on a number of projects, assignments related to food system transformation and in the natural resource management domain, primarily agroecology, soil carbon, regenerative and climate smart agriculture. He has also worked on climate resilient development and livelihoods and in private sector engagement. Welcome, Shalish. Thank you, Bharti. Thank you. Uh, so without uh, spending more time, I would just like to start off with uh, Shalish to get, get an overall uh, system system specific perspective because we were planning to have a government representation on the panel which had to um, back out because due to other preoccupations in the last minute but then i hope that our uh, set of panelists are experienced enough in different uh, domains and with different institutions to present a holistic picture so shalish i'll start with you and pose to you the same questions which i'll also pose to mr shiva kumar and uh, mr rajiv ahil which is first, uh, we have to know where we all are planning to go. So the question is that what does food system transformation look like in your perspective? How, how do we look at the end game, the outcome? The second question will be what role can government especially, because of your experience of working with the government entities in different states and countries, what role do you think that the state, the government can play with respect to um, uh, addressing the challenges that we, the four challenges that we, I spoke about before? And lastly, if government plays this role, what are the complementary roles we can expect the market and the civil society to play? So over to you, Shalish. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Bharti, for uh, this introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll take each question uh, one by one. And uh, first, I would like to, you know, address the first question that you asked that, you know, what what does this transition look like? And what's the kind of future scenario? I'll not go too much into detail on future scenario, because that's still uncertain with the kind of uncertainties that we are facing. Uh, and so what I see is that if you look at from the systems perspective, uh, you know, uh, systems uh, in systems thinking, there are stated goals and behavior. So while we see that, you know, goals are there, uh, we see prime minister making statements on promotion of natural farming, moving towards sustainable agriculture. Niti Aayog as an institution of government is also working on transforming food systems. Uh, but you look at the behavior and because these things have happened uh, only lately, this transition has started taking place only lately. We see that I think uh, more time is required, but what we see is that still uh, only 2% of uh, farmers are into organic farming. This is just one example. And this kind of shift has happened uh, only in few states, uh, not across. If you look at, let's say, one of the outcomes in nutrition that you talked about, one of the challenges. So in terms of nutritional indicators, India has made a marginal improvement over the years, uh, but still uh, macro and uh, micronutrient malnutrition is widespread. And this is actually exemplified by the recent uh, uh, National Family Health Survey. Uh, so that's one point. So we look at stated goals versus behavior in, in this transition. Uh, I think another thing which I see uh, happening during this transition is that this transition is going to be dispersed. Uh, we know that different states have started at different points uh, uh, in, in this transition. And, you know, before this, uh, there was another transition which took place uh, 50, 60 years ago, which was Green Revolution. And uh, uh, that transition actually bypassed some of the states. So what we see is that there are laggard states in terms of agriculture development in India, and there are progressive states uh, in terms of agriculture development. Uh, and when we talk about the transition to, uh, you know, uh, this current transition to more nutritious, uh, climate friendly uh, kind of agriculture, we see that there is a stickiness of current pattern in certain states. And one of the examples is Punjab, where uh, despite so much of investments in trying to shift farmers to different crops, and this is in the context of uh, you know crop burning that happens, uh, there is not much progress. Uh, whereas you see that in other states which were uh, legard states uh, in agriculture development, for example, in Odisha, 
uh, you see Odisha uh, Millet Mission uh, performing very well, and to the extent that uh, the national government has asked uh, different states to emulate that mission, uh, and and different states are actually adopting that particular mission. So there is a dispersion of transition, and uh, this will vary. Uh, what I see is that the transition will vary across states and farming systems. and different kind of goals processes incentives will have to be adopted we did a study uh, you know uh, uh, last year which was working on uh, uh, defining uh, regenerative foodscapes in india and looking at what kind of vulnerability uh, they come from and what needs to be addressed and what we see is that this this kind of different trajectory which each state will adopt uh, towards this uh, tra transformation uh the third aspect in this transition uh is the transition time uh i think currently we are uh, uh you know in the midst of this experimentation happening and i think this experimentation will go on for 4 to 5 years uh more uh but the characteristics of this experimentation is uh that the focus is more on production and there is less focus on linkages with market so i think that is uh, where the transition will go but ultimately after let's say 4 5 years when we will have learning from all the experimentation which is happening when we will have successes these will need to be scaled up uh, and i think at that point uh, we will need decentralized approaches to scale because we have a large variability in indian context uh, and this will require decentralized approaches to scale so i think that's what i think about the first question the second question uh, that you ask uh, is on what can state do uh, through tools available with it so although i am an outsider i am not a state but i think given uh, the experience that we have working with the state i think state is going to play a key role and uh, uh, so first i think is uh, we still don't have an integrated mandate for food system transformation we have things about we will move towards natural farming we will move towards others but the four challenges that you talked about and i think that integration is required in terms of a mandate uh, and this could be in the form of a theory of change that brings together brings back focus on sustainability on resource efficiency and circularity as central pillars uh, towards transforming food systems uh, so ultimately a systems approach needs to be adopted and i think one example comes to my mind is uh, you know one cgiar transition we know that cgiar consists of various institutions which are working across different geographies in the world working on crop specific uh, interventions also talking about nutrition and others so all cgiar institutions have come together under one umbrella for uh, looking at the need uh, for a systemic transformation and for institutions to come together uh, so this dynamic reformulation of cgiar's partnership knowledge assets and global presence is uh, basically uh, aimed towards uh, integration and uh, you know uh, impact in in the face of challenges uh, that you have also mentioned uh, you know those four challenges uh, the second thing which i think state uh, can do uh, through tools available with it is uh, to strengthen institution towards this integrated mandate once the mandate is there uh, and when i say strengthening institutions uh, you know i look back and uh, there was one uh, recent uh, work that we did uh, where we looked at private sector participation in forestry and what came out was that uh, given the conservation mandate of uh, forestry in india and 30 years ago that conservation mandate was perfectly fine and we needed to have that but what has happened in the meantime is that the institution uh, you know ha have lost focus from the production forestry so now we do not have that kind of uh, research to farm linkages in terms of increasing production in trees uh, also there is less research which happens uh, uh, in in at least public funded institutions on production forestry uh, so but now the need is to uh, given the need for you know improving trees outside forest in terms of agroforestry and other systems and looking at the carbon challenge or climate challenge that we have we need institutions who have worked on production forestry we need research which is production oriented so that's where the institutions will need to be strengthened in agriculture uh, sphere i think the the focus of the government was on supply side improving 
uh, you know availability of pro uh, availability of uh, produce that was the main objective and all the institutions have worked towards it uh, successfully but now there is need to change the uh, mandate of these institutions and therefore the capacities will need to be relooked at and these institution need to be strengthened uh i think third point which state can do is to uh, look at farms from the nutrition perspective and invest in nutrient dense farming systems instead of you know crop production or productivity oriented approaches and uh, i visualize these as integrated farming systems which will include crops horticulture poultry livestock uh, and even blue economy especially in coastal areas uh and larger investments will need to go into extension networks rural finance and insurance and market systems uh also i think farmers will need to be incentivized to shift uh and when i say incentivization already there are so many subsidies and incentives which the question is not to uh, reduce or remove these subsidies the question is that how these subsidies uh, or incentives can be relooked uh from the perspective of shifting to uh you know transitioning to a better food system uh there are also investment and technologies uh, which will need to be assessed and the one example which comes to my mind is the work that we did uh, with support from giz to create a, a agro ecology tool which the government is actually using to assess its own investment that how these investments are aligned with agro ecology principles so these are some of the tools which can actually make investments more uh, towards uh, addressing these challenges uh, so uh, another point which i think in terms of what state can do is to bring actors innovations at one platform we know that this kind of experimentation these kind of innovations will go on for next 4 to 5 years so the need is to bring actors and innovations at one platform so that these investments do not go into reinventing the wheel while I, while i understand that because of the variability in indian agriculture context one innovation which happens in let's say mp will need to be tested in orissa uh, in different agro ecological context but i think the idea is also that we don't uh, uh, you know lose uh, you know uh, whatever limited resources that we have on our and to reinvent the wheel so these are some of the points that i think uh, on on what state can do to tools available with it uh i think the last question that you asked was uh, what role of civil society and market uh, that uh, i see in in this transition i think civil society is going to play a major role because uh, of its flexibility of doing things with connect with different players especially with community and some philanthropic capital available to it and i i hope that philanthropic cap capital actually increases Uh, and i think the role will be in identifying and creating opportunities and innovations and connecting different actors uh, but i think uh, i also see that uh, you know from systems perspective if you look at you know one actor taking up another role because the government may have tendency to bring in uh, you know uh, civil society actors to scale up as well but when uh, uh, you know uh, civil society actors start scaling up uh the the risk is that the mindset should not become what the uh, government's mindset would be in scaling up which is to standardize so we might end up with uh, you know promoting millets but then we might end up promoting only one millet which will go against the diversification uh, which we require in this food system transformation uh in terms of market i think uh, large companies can think of uh, you know supporting and uh, providing incentives to farmer suppliers uh, to adopt regenerative practices at scale and these incentives could uh, include uh, you know guaranteeing purchase contracts offering premium pricing facilitating access to technical assistance and financing uh, some of this is happening in other spheres like uh, agroforestry and uh, potentially connecting these farmers to carbon credit markets which are emerging uh, we know that there are some programs which are already happening across the world uh, last year in sankal we had buyer foundation coming in buyer runs a, a program in uh, brazil and other countries on incentivizing farmers for shifting to low carbon agriculture so such kind of programs can be thought about and private sector uh, maybe can come in uh, for with incentives for farmers to shift uh, another uh, uh, thing that i think private sector can be involved in or can work on is the work on value chains and uh, this often means that creating value chains that are shorter a uh, more transparent and capable of capturing uh, you know more of products economic value where it is grown so more localized value chains uh, working on those 
uh, i also see that uh, a kind of uh, you know a wave of food and agriculture focused technologies uh, which is accelerating the transition and some of the uh, some of these uh, technologies are also towards uh, sustainable practices not all not all not all these technologies are towards that uh, but some of these are uh, in developed markets uh, what's happening is that entirely uh, new forms of technology enabled agriculture are already taking root uh, there are technologies which are creating healthier versions of existing food uh, in some cases entirely entirely new foods like uh, plant based meats uh, and large food companies may consider what these developments mean for them Uh, their innovation uh, technology strategy uh, what kind of partnerships they might need to launch uh, with innovative startups uh, or other technology leaders uh, and the areas in which they should acquire or invest in their own technology and the proper level of r&d spending uh, what i think is that in largely in this transition phase uh, government businesses and uh, civil society and other actors will need to come together uh, to design and implement interventions uh, that change the incentives and the scale of success uh, usually many of these will have to be in place at the same time to have a system changing effect uh, yeah thank you yeah. thank you shalish yeah that's an interesting uh, and very uh, diverse kind of a mapping uh, also for other actors and it's a good uh, sort of a setting stage before i invite now uh, mr rajiv ahel to put forth maybe build on and also add his perspective and experience especially looking at the role that uh, the civil society can play means the non government actors and non corporate actors can play in uh, addressing the four challenges so mr hel uh, thank you thank you bhatiji uh, as giz we've been we worked with uh, civil society government and private sector so i think it'll be interesting also to bring in the other uh, thoughts in terms of experience i would like to build on what shalish presented in terms of also looking at this whole theory of change and saying that if you really want a sustainable food system transformation uh, then i think we need to look at three interconnected parts so the first part of course is around the farm and the farmer that how do we improve the sustainability the reduce the input costs improve the marketability uh, and the price discovery of the farmer and the farmer organizations uh, but this is all on farm uh, if we don't if you see especially with the climate change variation that are happening that also shukumar ji was earlier alluding to uh, i think this the only sum the only uh, natural space that absorbs and gives a balancing uh, uh you know a, a twist to the way we have done uh, our agriculture is the whole landscape the watershed around a farm and i think unless we connect the farm what we do with the farmer to the watershed around and this is not just from a perspective of improving uh, command area development or ensuring irrigation at the right time i really mean long term experiences of what we are doing in jaz over 60 years of really looking at how will long term groundwater recharge happen how will the regeneration and the reduction of vegetation on all the nearby slopes also thereby affecting the microclimate of the valleys and areas where agriculture is done so how do you further make the local agriculture resilient uh to climate shocks and also to create this inputs that a farm needs beyond just fertilizers and inputs which we don't value so this nature part comes in so nature the farm and the and then the third part of course is if we keep pushing it only through subsidies and programs and incentives then the chances are it will work only to a limited extent and therefore it's very important that the consumer is actually aware interested willing to participate in buying such products not and i must say that it doesn't mean that these products have to be necessarily expensive a lot of the work we are doing on sustainable agriculture is showing that by doing some form of natural and organic farming you are already able to reduce to quite a fair degree input cost of the farmer which anyway directly to some extent becomes an income to the farmer without even having gone to the market so while trying to improve the larger picture so nature the farm and the plate and the consumer and therefore when we work at a nature level it is the entire community we cannot just focus only on the farmer 
at the farmer level it cannot be an individual farmer if the change is just we work with say 20 farmers in a you know in one village and there are 2000 farmers there that's not a nature of change so how do we really scale it up even at a farmer level fpos institutions they are not carrying these agendas of food system transformation right now they are just aggregators of the chemical rich agriculture and they become uh, we are forcing them to become another layer of aggregators how does transformation happen at that level and at a consumer level we have to build on this interest uh, concern that has come especially even after covid where many people not all are willing to look at sustainable food better food healthier food but how do we get their trust how do we buy their trust without very expensive certification third party systems which i don't know who's going to pay for if if not the market and that may be very limited in india's context right now so how do we find this trust based system for fairer markets market discovery uh, con- by the consumers as well so i think at a, at a, at a larger level if we don't bring these dimensions together either whether civil society government or private sector and i think there's a challenge here when you look at the whole work around the the, the watershed landscape part it remains a strong area for government investment historically and this is an area where to some extent civil society organizations were roped in to provide some level of uh, community development and implementation but has any one of them really thought seriously about taking it and connecting it to the farmer level if you look at the farm level the, and the and the consumption side the private sector has been quite active but uh, i know that there's been some work especially with itc as well on the watershed side but i think really going in that landscape level or looking at all the key resources needed today and in the future have we looked at it from that dimension and therefore are we linking with the government programs so very interestingly some of the work we do with nabard is helping map two and a half million hectares of watershed work they've done over 15 years and to see how agriculture could be focused as another layer sustainable agriculture on top of it so you know we we'll really need to work on scale to solve india's issues and problems and bring these partnerships together three trends in terms of transformation processes that i see happening i think is visible to all in india one is the gradual shift from what also shailesh mentioned the green revolution model from a high intensive to less and more uh, less uh, use of chemicals and fertilizer a more judicious informed use especially probably where cash crops and uh, high value uh, agriculture is involved uh, all, uh, so that is one transition process which is very very different for crops areas so that's one trend that is trending second one is uh, the organic one which has happened to a scale where like a state like uh, 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 madhya pradesh probably has the largest acreage of uh, and organic farming and also the largest number of registered organic farmers sikkim but all these states are still uh, now confronted with the next level challenge of actually finding markets and being able to sell these products so this is the second trend of organic which seems to have come to a point where it really needs next level support and help and the third of course is this uh, very old uh, part of what was called natural farming low input agriculture re- uh, regenerative agriculture working with crop and fields around multiple layers uh, which has been brought to a pretty sizable uh, movement for example in the case of andhra pradesh where uh, uh, the rysss and the government of andhra pradesh are now doing it with about i think closely about 500000 farmers himachal pradesh is doing it with about 125000 farmers so very low input agriculture no biological supplementing of chemical inputs into agriculture with externally provided uh, organic input so it's actually low input low so three trends here so i think this is for me the transition process and in order to move forward to the aspect of what could be the role i see the civil society uh, to be having a very important role simply because they are very contextually present in every corner of india with the such a large uh, variation of agroclimatic zones i think we need uh, grounded solutions for each one of them so i think 20 to 25 years of uh, civil societies we know some very good examples of agencies which are stars there are also some very interesting coalitions that have emerged very powerfully of these uh, civil society organizations so national coalition for natural farming uh, rra network many of these are coming together to now work across india and i think therefore connecting with such associations uh, would be very important i think also important is to on the demand side of it because whatever we keep doing as demonstrations or even government policies and subsidies if there's no demand side pick up on the farmer side and to shift the farmers 
a behavior from what we have made them do over the last 50 years is again going to cause uh, going to require a fairly high amount of um, uh, uh, mobilization on the ground so we need more partners so the other partners of course are the self help groups we are looking at something like 12 and a half to 13 million self help groups into 10 women and i know we many of the organizations here have experimented with it but i think this whole work of working work with day and rlm and really taking uh, uh, this transformational processes into uh, shgs would be very very powerful and there's a strong potential uh, fpos i've already mentioned as well so i think this all we need to do not in isolation i think we we need to a have a understanding at a national level but ultimately as also what shalesh pointed out some states are champions and some are still not so how do we look at champion states work with them look at their entire uh, landscapes subdivide them into clusters of commodities and value chains work with ones which are subsistence oriented and see what needs to be done there look at the ones where the surpluses are there and see what sort of supply chain so this work needs to come from a slightly larger level and it needs a partnership where we can then put our information knowledge experience data to start mapping states like this last but not the least of course the important work of the government and market players so i think uh, government has already announced in this budget speech this 5 kilometers of organic farm, natural farming on either side of the entire ganga which by the size of it is pretty large uh, so uh, in madhya pradesh the government has also announced something similar around narmada we know that andhra and many other states have also given their own targets so government can set targets and they can have these which can be monitored and push uh, sort of a transformative agenda uh, i think the concern here would be what sort of resources go into it how much of those resources are for really capacity building a lot of the work we did with a huge upnrm program with nabard where we did about 700 crores worth of lending to some of the most vulnerable groups in india uh, uh, along with kfw our development bank the experience was that uh, uh, if you provide 8 to 10% capacity building in terms of package of practices knowledge shifting what to do how to do when to do uh, farmer groups were able to take up to 90% loan and return it so if the scale of change that we need to see in india would need to access and leverage financing far beyond what government can ever make available so what is a conversation with banks are they really responding are they stepping up i think there is some hesitation there and i think this has been a classical nrm risk area and therefore there is a need for i think institutions like itc mahindra others who are also into uh, some form of, of rural financing as well to step into this area and push it i think one of the other challenge area remains of course is uh we've been looking at a whole slew of uh, mark, uh, you know uh, buyer seller meets these are very specific to value chains at a very low level and my experience of it is it hasn't led to much uh yeah buy in or a shift for farmers as well as for industry farmers need some long term commitments which is difficult for industry to give because they don't know the quality and level of production they will do and uh, and and the, uh, the so there is this impasse here so i think uh, the challenge for a country like india is where do we hang on a public domain and not uh, you know lying away with one fpo one uh, investment agency another development agency the whole macro data of how many farmers where are growing which type of millet if i have to look at the whole issue of millets next year we don't even have an idea of in which pocket of india which village which farmer will at least have x kilos of which millet by what month and unless this data is not there no large scale planning or implementation can happen and mind you it's not difficult i just did a very short exercise but one month back just on the phone with two villages and 20 farmers doing natural farming and just getting i found something like 34 different natural crops they were growing and when we added up the value of what they were uh, producing as a surplus these are hilly areas not very product high production limited amount of land they had converted into natural farming only one 10% to 25% 20 lakhs worth of goods for sale all the way from vegetable to cereals pulses very simple exercise nobody is doing it or it's being done in isolation so if there's no data we will not be able to plan to any and this will keep the fears uh, that even our economists and uh, country can have that would this shifts uh, uh, 
put the, the the food security of india into 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 jeopardy this is one level of evidence that uh, data we need and the second one which is uh, related to the aspect about cgr and icr i think there is still a bit of reluctance in the icr system to accept uh, these transformative processes in toto and it stems from the fact that the evidence the way uh, agriculture economists see uh, is not being presented to them in that sense i think if we are able to look at uh, the huge years of work that we have done be able to show uh, the input the cost benefit side data i think it will make a much stronger case for a higher uh, not just a propaganda and a policy but a higher uptake of uh, transformative agricultural processes because uh, the various institutions are now feeling uh, you know uh, uh, able to accept it or be understand what will lead to what uh one last thing and that is that in this direction we are working with andhra government we've set up uh, indo german global center for agroecological research and learning in uh, in andhra where the whole idea is to uh, develop uh, uh, through farmer research scientists and other civil society organization in other states all such evidence so i think data evidence and then technology i will leave it to for a later time i don't want to take up more time but there are lots of areas here where private sector can actually come in thank you very much thank you mr hell very very interesting in the entire canvas uh, you have added lot of uh, nuances also to this picture the importance how different players different kinds of players are picking up different parts of the chain and yet things are not coming up the requirement for scale and us maybe doing better on the ground than uh, with organic or regenerative agriculture than is made out to be and how to tackle the fears of uh, say uh, loss of food production and putting food security into jeopardy if we uh, practice regenerative agriculture or organic farming so these are very interesting points and a good <laughs> good base for mr shiv kumar also now to Uh, come in here and share what he thinks is the uh, first the uh, what will this food system transformation for a country like india can and should look like or may look like also and the role of corporate sector especially mr hell has also <laughs> drawn up a very big agenda and that truly is so that there is a lot of space for the sector and you are already doing also so mr shiv kumar yeah thank you bharti ji and uh, i think i completely agree with the the initial challenges raised by you as well as the need for a systems approach that uh, both shailesh and rajiv have uh, talked about while uh, the consumer nutrition and various other uh, needs of the consumer to some degree are being met and in natural course will also be met and similarly there is a fair amount of attention on the farmers and farmer livelihoods of the four i see that in the transition the big potential show stoppers are going to be uh, the uh, environmental resource whether we'll remain within the boundaries of the planet and more immediately the concerns about the climate change so i would call out these two in particular while everything is interlinked but uh, a more serious uh, show stopper can potentially happen here and therefore during this transition uh, if there is one big agenda it needs to be a nature positive food system uh, obviously all four are interlinked and uh, none of them are subordinate to any but given the level of attention that exists and given the uh, pathways that are visible as also the possible incentive systems that are there uh, there are incentive systems to meet the consumer demand there is uh, government engagement to support uh, the poor consumers from a nutrition perspective yeah, there there is some elements which need to be tackled but they are not like show stoppers uh, farmer incomes are low no doubt but uh, with the income support and other elements which are there that will also get done so so to my mind therefore uh, attention to nature positive uh, food system uh, basically which would mean how do you really optimize the entire environmental resource in production distribution and consumption whether it is in reducing water use or 
soil degradation, uh, which is really a big issue. Uh, the GHG emissions, which in turn have an impact on the climate change. Biodiversity loss, which again has impact on climate change uh, and, and pollution as, as we are witnessing. So I think uh, the, the opportunity, if you are able to do this, is that uh, uh, there is opportunity to meet the demand of food for expanding population as well as uh, growing incomes of people needing more food without necessarily uh, jeopardizing the planet uh, on one side. And uh, on the other side, improve how we are currently uh, producing food and consuming food. I mean, as, as all of us know, nearly a third of all the food produced is not even consumed, uh, is lost between the farm and the consumer. Uh, if it is in the immediate post-harvest and logistics in India, it may be post-consumer in some case, near consumer in elsewhere in the world. And therefore, uh, that's a huge waste of natural resource, the uh, human labor as well as the financial capital that is going. Uh, you produce and uh, don't even end up uh, consuming it. So therefore, uh, dealing with that wastage uh, is the other element. So, so I uh, really highlight that showstopper angle in terms of how we once see the transition uh, while agreeing the need for systems. So with this backdrop, uh, what can market players do to enable transition? And having identified that as a showstopper, uh, while rest of the value chain elements and all of that market players will do, uh, I would also focus on uh, how do market-based players deal with the uh, nature-positive food system? Yeah, how does one uh, enable that? Yeah. Firstly, I think is in raising consumer awareness as well as generating preference for nature positive food. Uh, because ultimately, it all starts with the consumption. And uh, if there is no preference, you may produce, whether it is organic, natural, uh, otherwise nutrition, everything. But uh, uh, only when it is consumed, that the value flows back along the system. And therefore, starting with raising consumer awareness and, and then transmitting those signals to the farmers is the uh, first element uh, that is required for the, uh, the market players. Second is by committing to the nature positive goals, uh, the larger companies in the food and agribusiness system uh, have to lay out and science-based goals for these things to say in terms of what are we going to do on water and soil and logistics and energy and everything else. So commitment uh, for the nature positive goals is the other you know, specific step. And third, uh, probably more crucial out of the four steps that I'm laying out uh, is enabling the farmers to engage in nature positive agriculture. Uh, so uh, while there are many islands of uh, nature positive agriculture, which is getting practiced. Uh, it is really in uh, expanding it literally to uh, everywhere there is crops or animal husbandry or any other form of food production that is taking place. How do you enable the farmers, uh, which obviously would mean uh, knowledge, which obviously would mean profitability. Uh, only then this will take place and therefore enabling farmers is the third step. And uh, uh, lastly, linking the farmers to consumer markets through traceable supply chains. And only when you do this linkage and through traceable supply chains, are you able to assure the consumers at one end, because I started with raising consumer awareness to generate preference for nature positive food, and therefore assure the consumer that's what is getting supplied. And at the other end, reward the farmers. Because through this production, when that uh, connect is there through traceable chains, uh, then uh, that rewarding of the farmers uh, would occur. Okay, not all of this is a wishful thinking that 
saying that no, this should be done, someone should do it. Uh, that's not the idea. Like both Shailesh and Rajiv talked about how their own respective organizations uh, contributing to the thoughts that they've expressed. So very similarly, uh, each of the elements that I pointed out is something that uh, ITC has uh, executed and done uh, at a fair amount of scale. Of course, a lot more scale is required to deal with the challenges that you talked about, uh, but at a, at a fair amount of scale and leaving that positive footprint on water, carbon, soil health, biodiversity, as well as in building climate resilience. Uh, just to touch upon three initiatives uh, before I go to your last question. One is on the water stewardship. Uh, Rajiv referred to it. Uh, there is both a supply side augmentation, which we have been working for 20 years, uh, where uh, the, the uh, rainwater harvesting and the storage structures which got created uh, and supporting the uh, uh, water user groups of the farmers. But this is far more directly linked with the farmers uh, than just water uh, as an end in itself. Uh, we have been able to support creation of uh, 43 million cubic meters, which is supporting as much as 1.3 million acres of uh, irrigation uh, for the land. And all of this is in uh, obviously rain-fed areas. But uh, over the last four years, uh, what you have seen is that a far greater value comes out of uh, demand side management uh, for a positive water balance. Uh, when we saw that, okay, supply side augmentation is occurring, but uh, uh, much like Rajiv did point out, you know, say that how do you look at the larger uh, river basin uh, in which one can influence the positive water balance? And then we saw whether it is habitations or agriculture along the whole uh, flow uh, in that area. And when we studied and uh, saw that uh, you can influence the demand side of water balance you can create a far larger impact. And just in these four years, uh, and reaching only about three lakh acres, we saw that as much as 200 million cubic meters of water could be saved every year. Yeah. It is five times as larger as we have done in just about one sixth of the time and annually. Uh, because across 14 crops uh, where we have been working, uh, anywhere between 25 to 55 percent of water savings, an average of 40, uh, is something which is done. And this really gave us uh, an inspiration uh, to take on a 2030 commitment that, uh, in addition to the 60 million cubic meters of storage, uh, we will do 2,000 million cubic meters of water savings in agriculture. That will make us completely water positive along the whole chain. Uh, today, over the last uh, 17 years, we say we are water positive uh, in terms of uh, uh, what we measure within our uh, boundaries consumption. But uh, the goal that is taken on for 2030 is that including water that is consumed in producing those crops, we make it water positive by virtue of how the water is saved uh, through these kind of practices. So water stewardship has uh, that kind of an opportunity. The second is in biodiversity conservation, uh, enriching biodiversity and reviving ecosystem services, whether it is in pollination or pest control or uh, again water and so on, by conserving village commons and also by reducing pressures on forests through fringe area development. So that's the kind of effort which is going on in the biodiversity conservation. And uh, across 29 districts that we had worked so far, uh, as much as 1.3 lake acres of uh, village commons have been conserved till date. And, and given the multiplier impact of this, the 2030 commitment that we have taken on is for about 10 lakh acres of the biodiversity conservation. And uh, possibly uh, something which will have a far-reaching impact is the third initiative, which is Integrated Climate Smart Villages Program, uh, where uh, when you say climate smart, uh, it is water smart, the nutrient smart, the carbon smart, and weather smart villages supported by smart institutions. This is a large scale uh, action research come implementation project, uh, dividing uh, uh, in the current area where we work uh, of uh, 2,500 villages. The villages have been classified as 
uh, how uh, resilient uh, they have been uh, to climate change and uh, how productive uh, they have been uh, for agriculture. And out of the quadrant which has been very resilient and productive uh, is where the lessons are drawn for all the other three quadrants. I think over a five-year work now, uh, more than 75% of all the villages are getting classified into uh, high productivity and uh, uh, high resilience uh, quadrant uh, through shared learnings across these uh, different levels of uh, smart uh, village initiatives. And uh, so taking on, uh, so we believe by 2030, we should be able to influence as much as 3 million acres. So I think all the steps that I talked about that market players can do in integrating nature positive uh, is something which is doable. That's the, that's the idea of sharing some of these uh, examples at uh, scale. And finally, closing with uh, what role, therefore, uh, we see for state and civil society and how do we partner. Uh, three uh, areas I would point out. The first is there is an economics challenge for dealing with this nature positive thing. Uh, one needs to resolve it. You know, there are two kinds of economic challenges. One is, you know, there is a today versus tomorrow conflict. The I uh, expend resource today or I put effort today, the benefit will come tomorrow. And therefore, uh, how do you convince people that you still need to do it? whether it is farmer or a logistic player or a consumer, whoever. The second is the me versus others conflict. That I do something, somebody else gains, uh, the standard tragedy of commons. And, and therefore, how do you convince people to uh, work on the nature positive uh, solution? That This is where innovations are required. And these things actually get further aggravated by market distorting subsidy. I think both the other speakers referred to this. Uh, you know, if there's subsidy on water and power, obviously to support one of the objectives, which is the livelihood support for the farmers, uh, which has impact on the environment. Uh, and that's where the system thinking uh, need uh, that was uh, referred to. So this entire uh, three steps that I talked about initiatives uh, really happen because of innovations in solving the economic challenge that by doing whatever recommended practice, are we reducing cost of cultivation? Are we improving yield? Are we enhancing quality? Are we getting better access to market and therefore better prices? So one way or the other, you need to demonstrate higher income today. And until such time that is not brought to the fore, the implementation of nature positive solutions is not going to occur. And therefore, that is the first area where partnerships will really be required. I mean, uh, whether government realigns the subsidies into different kind of incentives uh, on the nature positive behavior or civil society to mobilize farmers and create that kind of communication. And wherever whatever work that is done is completely in partnerships uh, of this kind uh, that we have been able to uh, do. The second uh, is potentially filling the knowledge gap uh, that uh, you know, there needs to be evidence from large scale pilots for all the stakeholders to get convinced and devote resources. And uh, uh, so each of the resource, each of the initiatives that I talked about uh, are getting scaled as we speak because Climate Smart Villages program uh, led to creation of state level adaptation plans uh, for climate in three states. And all three states are now integrating into their uh, state plans are in water and waste management after these pilots at scale uh, we become resource agency for uh, one state for water and one state for waste in the first instance and uh, so our role is to build capabilities of the uh, government functionaries for them to then implement uh, at scale and uh, many of the communication material and uh, all of this effort happens to the civil society and the last bit is that uh, if the whole trade flow and value chain connect continues to happen in the traditional manner, this nature positive uh, uh, shift is not easy to happen. One needs to create the alternate global supply chains for cross-border food production, much like it happened in case of information technology uh, outsourcing. Cross-border food production 
uh, is a possibility. Uh, some of you would have read about the recent uh, Indo-UAE food corridors. The demand is there. Food support comes from uh, India, given the natural resources we have, uh, which can strengthen the small farm, uh, farm old agriculture uh, through the uh, climate resilient practices and so on. So therefore, creating these alternate supply chains, uh, that model, uh, again, is a partnership. It's, it's something which is triggered by the government, uh, done in private partnership between the two countries, and uh, implemented on the ground with the help of civil society. Uh, so that, that's another kind of an example. So certainly it is possible to transit through even dealing with the showstoppers, uh, but uh, uh, it's not an easy task uh, and all players have to come together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shivkumar. Actually, yeah, you have put the spotlight where it should be, not in the not on the three actors that we started with, but with the real showstoppers that they, there is a limit, limit to growth that way, limit to uh, the way we are proceeding. So I'll, I'll, I have some questions, but I think it is the prerogative of the audience first. And we have a couple of questions here. The first one, which uh, maybe I'll uh, request first Mr. Shivkumar to take a shot, followed by uh, Mr. Rajiv Hill, is on the importance of, because you dealt with it uh, in terms of importance of a robust certification and inspection system. Right? We talked about scalability. And I'll just combine my uh, question with that. Uh, while this, uh, the question has come more of from the perspective of getting the, a good price for the, uh, for, for the farmer when a uh, consumer gets a real traceable and certified product. Uh, there is also, we see, because we are talking not just about agriculture but food systems, there is also the controversy we are seeing or the resistance to front of package leveling from the corporate sector as well because all the aspects of food, processed food and obesity is also linked with those kinds of uh, actions or acceptance of regulations. So how do we uh, reconcile these things and ensure that both the farmers and the consumers get their due? Yeah, consumer certainly requires, uh, without any doubt, uh, transparent labeling. Uh, but I think the conventional certification process for the smallholder system has been extremely expensive on a per unit basis. So I think therefore, uh, the role of technology comes in very significantly here. It's early days of experimenting with blockchains and creating business model on that. Uh, but I think if one is able to take on the advantage of technology, bring down the cost uh, of certification also for the smallholders, uh, then it is uh, far easier to support the transparency at the consumer end and the reward to the farmers. And I would say that the role of technology is rather critical here. So, Mr. Ahil, you would like to add something here on the certification bit? Yes. You know, I was... Uh, the quandary is that uh, we never ask with a current food system, which we know is full of fertilizers and pesticides, what is the levels of ppms of these in our food uh, I'm, as, as for market uh, consumer expectation market uh, requirement so we look at other characteristics which are important but we miss the most important ones right but when it comes to anything where somebody claims to be more sustainable maybe even at the same cost of product we want to do 50 put in 50 new different types of requirements which is like, uh, I'm sorry, just using a very simple example is to really punish the person who wants to be a farmer, wants to be holier or better than the others, right? So I want to break this uh, requirement of uh, needing to know to probably three levels. I think if you look at local level markets within, which is also one of the major areas for consumption and should be the first charge whenever any food system transformation is happening, that the healthiest food should first locally go to the area where it is seasonally grown, where the product cycle is short, where it can be efficiently, quickly sold and eaten up. Uh, I think at that level, having some level of uh, uh, different levels of branding it, of showing from a geographical tagging pers perspective of where it comes from, very simple, very low technology, people knowing which farmer, who's selling it, 
what is the level of maybe exposure with it some different forms of creating a trust in a very local market when it comes to more urban state and national markets i would say that there we we could look at this whole participatory uh, uh system that uh, the ministry of agriculture has initiated but which has also been uh, going through its teething challenges the pgs see if somehow this could be made more robust with technology so that uh, when we are looking uh, uh, within uh, with urban uh, consumers and in local uh, local areas uh, the uh, that level of information as is needed is there we are talking about not export products that have to you know comply to very stringent international export that is a third domain and there uh, how we could improve or bring down the cost of our third party certification systems so i think that's still work to be done but so i would see i would think that it's important to probably break up the market and respond to the market with different offering instead of trying to offer the same even if it's not needed uh the second uh, part of course is that also that uh, there could be different forms of branding so i know this uh, agency in uh, chennai which works with sustainable rice and paddy and which uh, then uh, you know collects the data on that instead of using say 4000 liters of water per kg they actually ended up using 1200 bottles because of sustainability practices so they put that on their label they say this rice used one third less water than a conventional variety of rice so i think there are different ways to get consumers to appreciate the nature positive and i think we should try out a whole a bunch of them instead of trying to have one standard uh, solution thank you thank you we are we are already on the we have crossed the finishing line so maybe it's time to uh, wrap up and i i think we got a lot of perspective in terms of the roles that different uh, kinds of players are already playing whether it is civil society or government and and the corporates and everyone brings their own strength to the table and while convergence is good and uh, we can learn from each other how to retain those strengths and not the civil society becoming the state kind of uh, actor without innovations or the state taking on roles in other places and then we have the limits uh, which uh, the show real show stoppers that mr shiv kumar also talked about we had we have some limits in our uh, conversation today because when we talk about food systems it is also about health it is also about drinking water and sanitation so there is there will be role for players both market as well as civil society there as well because we see a lot of fragmentation the way we have in departments also in uh, both sides so we have corporates in health working independently from those in agriculture and not addressing the food system challenge as a whole same with ngos working on sanitation not concerned with agriculture or food security so these there are challenges which remain and i'm sure that these kinds of dialogues the roles and the path that we have started uh, the country is on uh, we will be able to address all these challenges we have to just keep thinking keep acting so i'd like to thank you all for your presence the esteemed panelists and also uh, the audience for being here with us encouraging us thank you very much